My name is Matthew Reyes, as, as Lamont said. And I'm a professor at the University of Oklahoma. I teach construction management there. Um, so I, this is my second year full-time. I did it kind of part-time as I was in the industry. My, my industry background is I started off doing re building retaining walls. So I started off as a laborer um, on a retaining wall crew. Uh, I uh, spent many days digging ditches and uh, operating bobcats and um, which was great it paid the bills and I paid my bought my first car that way um, but uh, <coughs> after a few years doing that I ended up working for a, a general contractor doing multifamily homes and uh, I was just a field field hand for a con general contractor for a couple of years and then uh, I was went to school and um, I was a, a project manager for for another contractor uh, in the Dallas area and then worked in Dallas and South Texas, San Antonio area for, for several years doing that. So, um, so doing the retaining wall side, I did a lot of, we, we kind of did everything, residential, commercial roads, wherever people needed retaining walls. So I was fortunate enough to see a lot of different aspects of, uh, of how projects are, are run and, and, and organized by the owner. And, um, on the, GC side, uh, I did mostly hospital work, but a little bit of everything. Uh, whatever someone was willing to pay us to do is kind of was our motto. So, um, uh, so that's me. That's that's where I I come from. That's my perspective. <coughs> um, just to give you kind of an idea of how I approached uh, the the content for today, I, I knowing that we'd have a variety in the room. What what I didn't want to do, and there's some various reasons, but um, what I didn't want to do is just have a list of me talking for four hours of you saying, you should do this and you should do this. And when this happens, you should do this. Because one reason is that's really boring and I'd, I'd probably put myself to sleep, much less I can imagine how that boring that would be for you guys. Um, and also it, it only would apply, only maybe 10% of it would apply to each of you. So there's, all of you would have 90% that doesn't apply ever. Um, if we're lucky, 50% wouldn't apply, right? I'd, I'd really g if I was really, really lucky. Um, so the way I approach it, now I do have some kind of at the end of each section, especially at the very end. Here's some pointers. Here's some things you should do. But they're real quick, kind of quick hitty things. It's um, just basic ideas. Um, some of them are specific. Some of them are real general uh, to remember and, and things like that. Just from my own experience, I would would love for this to be a sharing because I imagine we could learn from each other. I could probably learn just as much from you as you can learn from me. But w what I wanted to provide was a, a context f that construction management is in. So construction management is actually a, a technical term. We use it, we apply it generically, like, oh, yeah, we're going to do some construction management, we're running a project. But it's actually a very technical term. It has a very specific meaning, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, so I kind of applied it both generically and specifically. And sorry, I, I talk with my hand, so if it's distracting, sorry. But um, so I wanted to provide s just a, an overarching context. So s at, at some points from the owner's perspective, what does the owner want? What does the general contractor want? What should you as a subcontractor look for? Um, because you as a sub, if if you're a sub or if you're acting as a general contractor, you're even if you're acting as a sub, you're going to have sub, your own subs, your own vendors, um, rental companies. So you you're not doing you're not a one man show. So everyone's got some sort of team working under them or with them. But if if I can convey the ideas that the general contractor, the owner, kind of the big bigger companies, what they want, what they're looking for then you can go and say, okay, this is how I fit into that. Okay, if we talk about design build, you can say, okay, that's what they want in design build. What can I bring to the table in the design build scenario? Because th or if we talk about safety or value engineering, which we'll get into those, okay, how do I fit in? What can I offer an owner? What can I offer a, a large general contractor on a value engineering exercise? So, but, it, but if I just were to go through and tell you, do this, do this, do this, it may or may not apply, and not to mention it would be really boring. So I wanted to start with kind of a historical context. How did we, how did we get to construction management? Um, some of it's 
real nerdy stuff that I, I like and, and hopefully will be interesting. Um, we, we won't spend a whole lot of time, but just to give you, you got an agenda. It's the second page of your, of your handout in here. So we're going to do three sessions. Um, we'll have 10 minute breaks. So we're going to, we're going to try our best to stay on time, but this is not a, this is kind of a guideline. So I do want to get a couple breaks in so we can uh, kind of get our, get the blood flowing, but, but, uh, any questions before we kind of start going through? Okay. So the way construction management as an idea came about, it, it's it's really a type of project delivery method. Does anybody have a, anybody care to give me a definition of what a project delivery method is? How the overall process is done. Yeah, so how, how the overall process, the whole construction project all the little parts and pieces that go into the delivery into delivering a project right because we're it, it's kind of a funny thing to think about construction as delivering a, a an asset or delivering a, a good but we are right we, we're building something we're delivering a product just like sony making playstations they're delivering a product well, construction is really the theory behind it's no different we're giving a product so how, what is everything that goes into that so uh, a textbook definition is a process by which the components of design and construction are combined in an agreement that results in a completed facility. So, fac and I use facility, facility and building generically. It just means the project. So, if it's a bridge, if it's a section of road, if it's a hospital, if it's whatever it is, if it's a house. Um, so, it's not just. So if it's, let's say if it's a house, it's not just the studs and the drywall and the shingles and windows and doors and all that. It's more than that. It's how did you write the contract and who did, uh, who actually did the work? So did the, did the owner do it all him or herself or did the owner hire someone that literally did all the work themselves? Or so it's everything that goes into that parts and pieces and all the contracting. How did you get paid for doing this? That That's a big part of it. So it's everything that goes into starting with an idea to getting a final product, and, and it's kind of a roadmap for how you get there. So a, a bit of a historical perspective on project delivery methods. So let's go way, way back, way, way back. So the, the first ever, you know, building may be a stretch um, to call it a building, but so how would the first ever construction projects, how were they delivered? Well, yeah, that's part of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> slave labor, yeah, unfortunately. Um, how were they delivered? So if someone had an idea for something they wanted, how did how did that product get delivered? Yeah, it was probably a guy sitting in the rain saying, I don't want to be rained on anymore, so... I'm going to cut down that tree and lean it up against, yeah. It was the purest form of design build, right? I've got an idea for something I want. I go and I harvest the raw materials and I make something out of it, right? I I pull those branches off the palm tree and and somehow support it over my head so I don't get rained on and I don't get sunburned anymore. I mean, it's the, the purest form of a des what we call a design build delivery. So... Ancient projects, now that's, like I said, calling that a building may be a stretch, but it, it is, it fits all the definitions of a facility, right? It's, it's shelter, um, which is kind of the, the essence of, of what a facility does. Um, so ancient projects, so if we go back, you know, the pyramids, someone designed them and built them. So St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, Michelangelo designed it. So he thought up the idea of what it was going to look like. He managed the whole construction process. He d he did the architectural design and the engineering design. Uh, he he managed the whole <laughs> before right before engineering kind of broke off as its own as its own branch, right? And we'll talk about how architecture and construction broke off, but engineering and architecture did the same thing. So he did everything, right? Um, and I I kept this in just because it it's a uh, maybe a subtle jab at the architecture community um, as much as I l as much as I rely on architects <laughs> and we all do but so this 
Right. <laughs> so architecton is the, so it comes from two words in Greek. So that's the transliteration. Arche, which means the beginning. So like if uh, a Greek translation of, or the original language, Greek translation of the Old Testament in the Bible is in the beginning. It's arche. So it's more than just the beginning. It's not just when you start the day. It's, it's like the beginning, the preeminent of all things like the beginning so it has a lot of meaning behind it and then tecton or tectone is actually how it's pronounced what it what it means is builder or it doesn't have it's hard to translate into english builder craftsman carpenter mason it's translated lots of different ways it's actually the profession of jesus so w- like i said there's it's hard to translate into english because it, it means a lot of different things depending on context so why I say this is a subtle jab is this is the name that architects decided to give themselves. So the profession of Jesus and then the best one ever. So, um, um, well, I'll leave it at that. So it just, c- it, it makes me laugh a little bit. Kind of gives you an idea of what the first architects thought of themselves. Um, not that contractors are any better, but. So this person was responsible for all the design and managed all the construction process. So ancient writings assume that they don't even, they assume this is the same person. There's not even really language that would allow for this being but done by two different people. There's no, there's no um, leeway. Or th- it's just, they don't even say it's done by the same person. It's just assumed, well, of course, you would design it, of course you would build it. So that's just kind of how it, how in the ancient world it was done. Uh, and we'll go through this kind of quickly, but the the first architect, as we know, it's this guy, if you want to look that up, feel free, it's in your notes and stuff, but uh, Leon Alberti in the 1400s, so when you think about how long we've been doing buildings, um, it wasn't until, you know, 600 years ago that the concept of just a designer even came along, and he wasn't very popular, it didn't really take off until a few hundred years later, but the idea that architecture was an art form and it was really separate and di- distinct act from construction. Uh, that's kind of when it, when it came along. So late 1485 is when he published that work. And I don't spend too much time on that. Um, and this name should be familiar probably to most of you. Flank- Frank Lloyd Wright. He's kind of the last of these master builders we, that we really had. And we, we've still got some, that, you know, small design firms that, that do a lot. And especially engineering firms and would you say y'all are master builders? Yeah, Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. Pretty good. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that it's not highly publicized, but yes, um, I think it's more than more than one. Yeah, has has uh, water infiltration. It was, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fortunately, he wasn't around for the criticism either. But, uh, but yeah. So, but you bring up a good point. In engineering firms, this is still, uh, it's not a lost art, I should say. It, it still goes on. It's designed and built and project is managed by the yeah. one entity. Right, uh, but we'll get into kind of the whole concept yeah, of design build. Yeah, right, right. Uh, so th- the way this kind of started breaking apart was in during the Industrial Revolution. So w- w- the interesting, interesting thing about it is that we were able to divide because things got more complex. So it became more difficult for one person to have as enough expertise to do all the design for all the parts and pieces and know how to put all the parts and pieces together. That became increasingly difficult as technology advanced. So kind of a slow uh, curve in tec- technological advancement and then in the industrial age is just a surge of, of uh, advancement. So this surge of advancement made it difficult to for one person to do everything. Uh, so that's what kind of the idea of program expertise. C- we divide our labor and become experts in a more narrow field. And people were willing to 
to be entrepreneurial, it kind of engendered this this idea, this this culture of entrepreneurship uh, and taking risks. Um, some more recent developments, and so this is uh, one thing you'll hear about is people say, "Well, design build is new." Well, it's not really new. It's, it's what we were doing for thousands of years, but so w most most of the time people are talking about the last hundred years uh, or or less. So I guess. It is new if we're being kind of uh, um, egocentric, <laughs> um, if you will, chronocentric, looking at our own time period. But in in 1857, the AIA was founded, the American Institute of Architects, and that, that acronym will come up a couple times later on. So AIA is the American Institute of Architects. Um, they it was kind of a big boys club of architects that they wanted to kind of establish what it means to be an architect, um, which is good. A lot of really good things have come out of it. Um, kind of defining their role in society and in the construction design and construction process. Um, but what happened was this, this club of architects, uh, kind of a side effect was it, it created this cultural divide between the folks that were doing the design and the folks that were doing the, the construction. So it made a real cultural um, distinction between, al almost stratified, well, these are the design guys, these are the smart artist guys, and these are the, the, the construction guys. They're just the lowly construction guys. So it, whether that was an intentional or unintentional uh, result, it, it was a side effect nonetheless. Uh, and then licensing laws, so as AAA, they started, as AAA developed, they started kind of a, creating rules to, to get into the club, essentially, um, which, I mean, is really not unique. Uh, same thing with medical societies and bar association. To be a lawyer, you've got to pass the bar to get into the club. You know, these are, these are good things. It, it kind of controls, and so you kind of know what you're getting. Not just anyone can walk in off the street and be an architect, right? You, you kind of want to know who's, know that they know what they're doing, right? It's nice that we know that an architect and engineer have designed this, that the roof is not going to cave in on us. That's a good thing. Um, so the the Miller Act, here's a, another um, legislation. So architects kind of defining themselves as their own group, and then government legislation started to, to break up the trade uh, of design and construction. So the Miller Act required for all federal work, so the contractor doing federal work had to provide bonds for performance and labor material. So payment and performance bonds, P&P bonds, you probably heard them called. Um, that made it hard. If you're, so if you're just an architect and you're not doing large amounts of work for large amounts of money, it's hard to get that bonding capacity. So it kind of weeded out a lot of architects from being able to bond that. So it really divided the contractors who were doing that volume were able to get that bonding capacity. So it, it, div it further divided. So even the architects that were trying to bridge the design and construction, a lot of them were unable to. So it encouraged this it kind of further divided and encouraged this separation and specialization. And some public contract laws, which we'll get into a little bit. I'm going to talk about proposals. Uh, so it's really procurement laws. How does the how does the government buy a building or buy a road? Which is what procurement means. You can go and buy it. Is really what it means. Um, it just sounds weird if you say I'm going to procure a Big Mac, but that's really what it means. Um, they're required to pick the designer based on their qualifications, and they pick the contractor based on what what are, what is what's the low what's the common how, how does a contractor get a job low bid. He, low bid yeah so designers based on qualifications contract based on on price the lowest bidder gets the job so to just to list the the four main types of uh project delivery methods that are in place today so it's, it's really three and we'll kind of blow through this one pretty quickly just because it's basically the same but um, design bid build which this is so this is what resulted from that kind of separation 
the design bid build. So we had design build for hundreds or really thousands of years. And then we kind of, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, kind of converted into this design bid build. Someone designs it, then, so let's just use a, a bridge, for example. Someone designs a bridge, they put it out to bid, the low bidder gets it, and then it's built. It's a very linear linear model. And design, bu design build is, okay, design, it's designed and built by the same person. And then we kind of migrated, we, we tried to correct our mistakes, and we, we came up with this construction management idea, which we'll, we'll talk about. So CM agency is one. S this is very common. CM at risk, construction management at risk, which usually, the vast, vast majority of the time, you'll hear it called, so uh, these in parentheses are kind of colloquial terms. So if you say a project is hard bid, it means it's design bid build. Hard bid meaning I gave a price and that's the price I'm sticking to. There's no, not a lot of negotiation. You write out a bid and that's my price. It's $500,000. That's it. That's a hard bid. Uh, construction management at risk, cost plus with a GMP. So meaning whatever the cost is plus a percentage for my fee or for my profit with a guaranteed maximum price. Owners like that guaranteed maximum price and rightfully so. So you can't just keep spending and spending and tacking on a fee and spending and spending it until you just get tired of spending. They want to cap you somewhere, which they should. I mean, they shouldn't just let you spend as much as you want. They could, you can imagine how that would be taken advantage of. So again, just to recap, design, bid, build, owner hires an architect. And let me go, I use architect fairly generically here. I pro sometimes I actually think sometimes I have designer, sometimes I have architect. So really the architect and or engineer, um, maybe just an engineer, maybe just an architect. Sometimes the architect gets the whole project and then he or she will go and hire the engineers. So the architect doesn't do the structural, uh, design the structural system. He will sub that out to, an in to a structural engineer. He will sub out the mechanical systems to a mechanical engineer. But just know architect means the all the architects and engineers, all the designers that are involved in designing the project. So that's kind of what that means. So owner hires an architect for design. Then once the design is complete, multiple contractors prepare a lump sum bid or that hard bid. It's just one number. This is my price to do the whole thing. But this is the big thing, based on completed design drawings, all right? So once designs are already done, then we start bidding. So the, the three phases are sequential. First you design, then you bid, then you build. And this is kind of the contractual, a kind of little graphic showing the contractual nature. The owner has a contract with the designer, and the owner has a contract with the contractor. There is no contract between designer and contractor. No contract there. All right, and we'll get into why that could be an issue, but there's really not even language saying that they have to get along. You know, that's, that just is, it's com two completely separate contracts that exist, okay? Some of the advantages, you know, when you start bidding, when you start construction, you got a complete set of drawings, right? Complete set of drawings, okay? How many projects have you been on, and you may have the best architect and engineer in the world that you didn't have an RFI or some question that, a detail that didn't match up? It doesn't exist, right? I, I always tell my students that you may see a little note in the bottom that says 100% drawings, but there's really no such thing as 100% drawings, right? There's no such thing. Hopefully the as-builts are 100%, but even as-builts have mistakes in them, right? Because we go and do our as-builts, and we make mistakes too, just like the designers did. So. And we don't really have an excuse. We saw it go in the ground. <laughs> we, so at least the architect had the excuse of he didn't see it yet. But um, So you theoretically have a complete set of drawings. So you can plan. So well, let me ask you, what would be some advantages of having a complete set of drawings when you start work? How, how is that better than having some partial set? Any thoughts on that? You mean how much meter you can go? Your quantities or... You're right. Your bid should be accurate because you know what you're installing. You know how much you're installing. You know where you're installing it. So knowing all those things, 
you can plan, make a plan for material delivery, staging on site, sequencing of, of trades. You know, you can tell your vendors when you need certain things, when you need submittals. There's all sorts of advantages to having a complete set of drawings. Absolutely. If you, s if you can sequence things, because you can do it faster, right? And probably cheaper if you're buying things in bulk. If you know how much material you need, you can probably get a better unit price. Uh, you can save the owner money. You can probably put a little more profit in your pocket, too. So there's lots of advantages to having a complete set of drawings. The owner, this, so this would be from the owner's perspe perspective, you, a fixed price. Okay, it's, it's a lump sum. So this is the price I'm doing it for. Great for budgeting purposes, for getting, uh, getting a loan, getting an interest rate set on a loan. Lots of advantages are having a fixed price and not this kind of moving target. Can you imagine going and buying a house and, and them giving you a range of what the price is going to be and you have to go get it? Yeah, that would be difficult, right? You go to the bank and get a loan. Well, I'm going to pay about $120,000 for my house. Okay. That, no, the bank don't want to hear that. This is how much you're going to pay, right? So the, the owner, this is great for the owner. It's low owner involvement. He says, this is what I want, gives it to the designer, takes those drawings, gives it to a contractor, and lets them fight it out on site. Right? So the owner doesn't have to get involved. Unless they want to, they don't really have to get involved. And again, for the, from the owner's perspective, the contractor taking all that risk, because this, this is risky for the contractor, right? If you go over, sorry. If you go over that price you stated, then it's, that's too bad. That's coming out of your pocket. It's great for the owner, though, because the contractor is assuming a lot of that risk. A good thing for the contractor, though, there's a lot of benefit for being uh, innovative, finding a way to do it faster. So you, you plan, you give a good faith estimate of how much it's going to cost, but then you realize, oh, actually, I can I can double dip on this shipment. I can ha I can p put them on the same truck. And I can get these two, whatever it is, deliveries on the same truck. I save a ship shipping cost. I should put pocket that shipment fee. Uh, or you figure out a way to do two things at the same time. You save time. All that time I save because time is money, right? All those laborers I was going to pay, I don't have to pay them now. I can put them on another job where I'm paying them. I pocket that money. So this great benefit or potential benefit for the contractor, if you find a way to save time, save money, it all goes in your pocket. There's some disadvantages, though. This is adversarial relationships, right? Because the designer is supposed to have the owner's best interest in mind. The contractor, once you've put your number on the table and, and you've signed a contract for a dollar amount, what are you after? Profit coming in under that dollar amount. So you don't care if the designer screwed something up and it's going to cost him more. Tough. I need more time, which is going to be more money, or I need overtime, or you can pay me to fix it. Uh, so we'll talk about change order issues later, but it creates this adversarial relationship. It's just kind of, just kind of a natural outflow of that. Owner has a contract here and a contract here and then makes them work together. It's kind of a natural real, uh, natural result of it. It's a long delivery time. So why would this take a long time from idea to completion? What would be kind of a reason for that taking a long time? Those I exactly. You don't bid until design's already done. And you can't build until bidding is done. So it happens linearly. So yeah, you can't overlap your stages. And this is a big one we'll get into why CM is important. There's no constructability input during design. Anyb anybody, you've heard the term constructability or you know what that means kind of at all? It's, it's a big buzzword these days. There's a handful of buzzwords. I'll try to point them out just so you, uh, so you know. But um, So th the idea, and we could, we could do a whole day on constructability. We won't because you all probably do it every day. You just don't know you're doing it. Um, An expert, so you could use a, a steel erector, would be an, an expert in steel erection, right? An iron worker would be. 
looking at a set of steel plans and and going back to the engineer and saying, actually, this connection's no good. You know, if you change this detail, we could install it with a with a smaller crane. Those kinds of things would be constructability. How constructible is the design? There's none of that in design bid build. The architect and engineer are doing all of the all of the design kind of on an island, not getting input from the experts, which really y'all are the experts, right? If there's someone that should be giving input to the design, it should be you guys, right? You don't have that in design bid build. It's a high potential for changes because not getting input from experts, gonna be some things overlooked, some mistaken details, creates changes, right? Which is cost to the owner. Um, this fix, and therefore this fixed cost can be deceiving. So this whole big advantage that the owner's going for, I have a set cost and it's fixed and that's my cost. Well, not really, because what if they're change orders? Now, owners are smart enough to know that there's going to be change orders, so they set aside some money, but it's really hard to know how much to set aside. If you're not getting good input, how, what's the quality of your drawings? So that's, that's a, hard, it's a hard number to really get an accurate kind of guess on a contingency. So the, the low initial bid does not always mean lowest final final cost. And does that unpack that a little bit? So just because a contractor is a low bid on bid day, if you were to if you could in theory award them both the project and let them do the whole thing, it doesn't mean they would still be low at the end. Because they may be a better contractor. Maybe they included some things. They said, Oh yeah, I noticed that I noticed that you have sinks on the third floor but you have no water lines going to the third floor. But I went ahead and included them because I'm not an idiot and I know you need them, right? But per the letter of the law, you don't have to include that kind of stuff. So someone that's less than ethical is trying to get low on bid day, doesn't include that, and then two months later says, oh, by the way, here's your change order for those water lines. The letter of the law, the way these contracts are written, you don't necessarily have to include that. Now, a good contractor that's going to get repeat work would say something about that. You let Lamont in. Um, is that an ethical? It, 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 yeah. Is that an ethical issue on the contractor's part, or are they simply bidding the documents that were done? Right. It, well, it is a. Uh, it's. All right. So Chris asked if. Uh, all right. And I'm going to try to remember to repeat questions so y'all can hear. But so is it, is it an ethical issue in not including things that you probably should know should be included? So it is not. It's not illegal. It's not a breach of contract. Yeah, and an unethical. That's kind of the thing about ethics is there. It's this nebulous idea, right? It's it's all gray, right? So uh, it's not going to get you repeat work. So it's not technically wrong or maybe not even technically immoral or, or unethical, but it's not a good way to do business if you want repeat customers because a smart owner is going to know, come on, you're a plumber. You know that I need water at the sinks, right? So you should have included that. But the plumber could come back and say, hey, I was competing against all these other people. How do I know they weren't going to include it? They're going to bid the drawings, right? So, so you can argue both sides, and really they'd be right. Um, I've got, this is a kind of a note at the end, but I'll say it now. Your best bet, if you see something like that, bid it per the drawings, bid it exactly per the drawings, and make a note at the end. I see that you have no water lines on the third floor at all these sinks. Here is my price to go to provide water lines. Yes, sir. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 So yeah, he's saying that. Uh, um, well, I won't try to repeat everything you just said, but uh, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, one way subcontractors can increase their bottom, bottom line is through change orders, which is if they're legitimate change orders is a totally legitimate way to do business. Actually, the contract will typically tell you you're allowed to charge this much profit on change orders, which is usually a higher percentage than on your base bid. Because on that base bid, you're trying to compete against everyone else in town, right? So what's the easiest way to lower your number, lower your price? Reduce that profit, right? Reduce your fee. It's a quick way to do it. You don't have to go through and check quantities. It, you just, I'm bidding at 3.5%. Okay, I'm going at 3%. That immediately drops your bottom line, right? Well, not your bottom line, your your uh, your bid, your 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 lump sum um, hurts your bottom line. So on a change order, though, are you trying to be competitive? No, you don't have to be competitive because you got the job. So that's why uh, the contract will typically tell you this is how much you can charge because owners and GCs have figured out, well, if we just let everyone, subs and vendors and everyone run wild with change orders, then they charge whatever percentage they want. So they'll say you can charge, you know, and a lot of times it's, 5% on materials, 10% on labor. There's different variations. Um, you can you can even mark up your, if you have a sub-sub, you can mark up their cost and they'll tell you how much. Every contract's different and we won't get into the details but because they all change. But So a good subcontractor or general contractor would identify this is the cost. Now, you stand to miss out on a little bit of extra profit you could have gotten in a change order because if you put that here's my price for the extra water lines on your bid you're stuck with that price like you're married to that price now if things change and that's different if, it, if they add a fourth floor or they add more sinks then it's not but at least per those drawings you're stuck with that price and you can't kind of up the your your uh profit you know pro you can't do that five or ten percent you're probably tr you're still trying to be competitive so you're at a little lower rate but you're probably more you're more likely to get a second look from the owner from the general contractor because they notice oh this guy's he's picking up all the all the gaps so he's got all those gaps included i don't have to worry about looking like an idiot and going to the owner and say uh yeah that thing that we all should have known about here's your change order for it um, so if he knows that you're covering all those things, I know that's how, if I was, when I was awarding subcontracts, that was a big check mark in the plus side for a sub. If they were identifying, just calling out, hey, I noticed you missed it. I didn't include it in my base bid because I'm trying to match plans and specs, but this is what it's going to cost if you want me to do it. And by the way, you're going to have to do it. So rule of thumb, always conform exactly to plans and specs. But do your best to identify those those missing areas and and address them. Now there's different ways you could do it. You could attach an an, an addendum or an appendix to your bid and saying here's some clarifications. You can do an alternate. There's different ways you go about it. And that's just kind of up to you how you want to do it. But um, address it kind of after the bottom line. So below the bottom line, these would be some additions. Uh, a, a disadvantage, so low risk for your owner, high risk for contractor. Again, you're stuck with that price. Um, if you go over, you go over, it comes out of your pocket. Unforeseen conditions pose a particular risk. Different owners approach this differently. Um, even within government agencies, they approach it differently from one state to the next, from one really one office to the next. What is an unforeseen condition? It's hard to define because it's unforeseen, right? So, you know, if there's underground utilities that you didn't know were there, well, most owners won't hold you accountable for that because in order to find out they're there, you would have had to go and dig. In order to dig, you would have had to have a permit. In order to get a permit, you would have had to have the job, right? So they won't hold that again. But some things like, what if there's an overhead power line and I can't get my crane in here? Well, did you go visit the site? You know, so... Now those t are two extremes, you know, but the hard part is when it's in the middle and and uh, you know the water line size or the, the the type of soil you're digging in, you're trying to compact. You know, they're kind of I there's rock as you're excavating, you hit rock, 
well, the soils report says, you know, at these two points, it's going to be at a certain elevation. Well, and I'm in the middle. You know, that's kind of a risk you take, you know, but you didn't know. But again, with this lump sum, you're stuck at that lump sum. You don't get to recuperate into that cost. Uh, typically low margins for a contractor, right? Because you're trying to be competitive. Like I said, easiest way to drop your numbers, drop your, your profit. And I'll try to speed through the last few, but... Um, so design build, owner hires a single entity, right? One contract. Let's see, I think I have a little graphic there. One contract, the design builder, right? And this person does everything. Uh, the design, pricing, construction phases are often, it's really continuous, but it's and simultaneous. So there's not a, we do the design, then we do the bidding, then we do the construction. It's all kind of happening at once. Even the the budgeting, really. Now, that's not entirely true because in order to get awarded design build, you've got to give some kind of price. Now, different entities vary based on, you know, are they going to hold you to a certain price? Is it going to be cost plus? There's other diff various ways to structure it, but a lot of times it's you give a price for design and construction. But the great thing is you've got a price. You can pick materials that fit within your budget. Right, because you're the designer. Now, you can't just pick junk. You can't put siding on this building, right? There's going to be certain limitations you have to, or constraints you have to work within, but uh, there's a lot of flexibility in, in the way you do it. And the, the biggest advantage, well, yeah, so selected on qualifications and price. Um, but the, the biggest advantage for the owner is one point of contact. There's not two contracts trying to make them get along it's one contract and a lot of people say that it's one butt to kick um whether that's right or wrong or indifferent um it's, it's the reality the owner just got one person he or she's got to deal with and maybe the biggest d uh benefit just l on a large scale basically kind of a global perspective it's a lot faster because you're doing everything at once, so you go really fast. High constructability, because the architect, so let's just say it's an architect uh, and general contractor that team up. There are different ways of doing it. You guys do it all in-house pretty much. Um, some people yeah. will team up, do a joint venture with uh, you know an architect and a contractor will just kind of team up and create a, a company. It's a one-time deal. So it's it's a design build project. Um, there's different ways to do it, but the the end result is there's one contract. Architect and contractor are together. Now, if they're together and they know who's going to be doing their work, they're going to bring those guys on board, right? If if I'm doing a design build project and it's a a hospital, well, there's a lot of mechanical systems in the hospital. I'm going to bring my mechanical contractor to the table when we're doing the design of the mechanical system. So I'm getting the input, not only from the engineer, not only from a general contractor, but probably the guy that's going to be installing the ductwork is going to be at the table when we're doing design. So high degree of constructability. Uh, reduction in claims, because you've got that one contract, um, you've got a lot of leeway. Usually projects are on time and under budget, so they don't. there doesn't need to be claims. Uh, and just for a stress reduction benefit there's you don't have this adversarial relationship between the contractor and the designer and if you do that's a whole different set of problems because you can't get along with the guy in your own team and if you can't get along with the guy in your team you're not going to get along with them in any scenario right so um, rapid reaction to scope changes so if there's a change order you can do the d let's say the owner just wants to do something different i want to uh, I want to add a cabana outside, or I want to, I want to modify how the entrance is, or or whatever. I want a different type of siding, or whatever the owner requests. You can react quickly to it because you got the designer there at the desk next to you, and you design, and and that whole process just goes so much faster. Uh, some disadvantages: there's fewer checks and balances. Right, so one one advantage of that adversarial relationship between contractor and architect is that they're both keeping each other in check. Uh, again, for better or for worse, um, 
we like to think it's because uh, they're trying to help each other out. But on, uh, honestly, they're trying to help the owner out. So, but the owner knows that those guys are keeping e each other in check. With the design build, you don't have that. It's one team, so you don't have them kind of check. You don't have the architect looking at the change order saying, that's way too expensive for what we're asking to do and, and vice versa. Uh, you don't have the contractor saying, you don't need to design it that way. You don't need a, a beam that big or whatever the case may be. Uh, so there, which results in reduced owner control. So the owner's got to kind of relinquish, which could be an advantage. The owner may not want control, may not want to be involved, but a lot of times they want some sort of control over the design and the, the construction. Th they have to relinquish a lot of that. Uh, it can be difficult to clearly define the scope because you basically just write down what you want and let them design it, which is a little bit hard to define what's a change order, what isn't. Uh, and as a result, there can be a lot of scope changes. So a lot of potential change orders, but how many of them really are? Uh, it's harder for the owner to select a project team. Right? In design bid build, pick the most qualified architect, pick the cheapest contractor. Okay, When they're a team, well, which one is the most important? I don't know. Qualifications is probably the most important because then it's going to give you a better price. Right? At least that's the hope. Right. When, yeah, well, the, the A plus B, yeah. yeah. The, the, the it's very slanted for the contracting model. Yeah. It, it is still, uh, still slanted that way. Um right 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 Right, but that, yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah the idea is that you. Once you start comparing price, you're only comparing the prices of people that are, are groups that are already qualified. So in theory, it's a level playing field. How applicable that theory is, uh, but uh, at least in theory. But then you're right. Then once you've kind of filtered down to qualified contractors, price does get a heavier weight. It just It's just the way the world works. Um, it results in a large staff for the design builder. Right? You've got to have a lot of people to do all this, which the result of that is not a lot of firms can do it because you've got to have a big firm, which means you have a big payroll, which means you have a big overhead. And so and if you, in order to cover your big overhead, you've got to do big projects. So not everyone can do um, design build. Although, interestingly, you go way down in scope, and you have a small scope, like you're doing just a, a house or a remodel, a very small scope, then only really small firms can handle it, right? Because that can't cover. So design build is best for that. So it's kind of interesting. The very small and the very large is where it's the best applicable. Uh, again, increased risk for the design builder because they're, they're all these scope changes are potentially going to fall in their lap. So on to construction management theory, finally. Um, the whole idea behind that, and I, I put that up there before I meant to, but um, the whole idea behind all this, the advantages we get with design build versus the, the big shortcoming in design bid build is that we don't have the technical experts. Or a lot of time you'll hear them called SMEs, subject matter experts. We don't have the technical experts involved in the design process so in design bid build you don't have the plumber you don't have the, the utilities crew providing any input into the design 
the actual experts in that piece of the work, they're not giving their input. They're only giving their input once they give you a change order. That's kind of the first piece of, of input the owner gets from them. S and then you go to design build, you go, we swing all the way in the other direction and you get lots of input, lots of input from contractors, designers, but it's hard to handle a project that big by most of the firms out there. So the very, very small and the very large, but the 90% that are in the middle, they can't feasibly do that. So the industry's response was to come up with this idea of construction management, which is getting technical experts involved when they need to be involved, right? The earlier, the better. That's kind of the mantra. When should you put your schedule together? The earlier, the better. When should you get people involved? The earlier, the better. Right? So that's, that's kind of the, the earlier, the better theory as a construction manager. So a, a contractor can be involved in design while the owner still gets to maintain the control that he would have in a similar like a design bid build scenario. Still has that control and, and uh, over the whole process, design and construction, while still getting all these experts involved. We can reduce the duration of the project delivery, and uh, we'll go into how. Uh, now, with this construction management, it's not a competitive process as long as design bid build. So, and by as long as, I mean as far into the design process. So, construction manage, or sorry, design bid build until drawings are complete. So it's competitive up until 100% documents. Well, CM isn't, doesn't go that deep into the process, but much more than design build, right? Design build is, once the idea is written down, it's no longer competitive because it's been awarded, right? So uh, CM maintains that longer into the process. So the idea of CM agency, and we'll kind of skip through this because we're short on time, but um, basically it's an owner's rep that's acting as a construction manager. Um, so you, you've probably all seen or heard, at least heard of the concept of an owner's rep. Uh, basically that's a CM agent, or that's what a CM agent does. So it's somebody with knowledge of the construction process that's acting on the owner's behalf, whether it's on site or, or not yet. Yeah, you'll hear it called CMGC. That's more CM at risk. It would be called CMGC. Yeah. The triangle, the way it was explained to me is that the triangle that you showed in the first mm -hmm. that, that didn't have a bottom to right. it had kind of a dashed line. Yeah, well. The encouraging of collaboration. Yeah, I, th I think I've got one almost identical to that. I don't know, I'm curious to see where you, he where you heard that because um, I thought I was real smart and made that design. Apparently, it's, <laughs> been, apparently it's been, been used before. Um, no, that's no, that's all right. I'm glad to know it. <laughs> um, so the idea behind CM agency, really, just to boil it down, is so if I'm going to a hospital, I'm going to get my appendix taken out. I don't want that surgeon thinking about uh, compressive strength of concrete and how is it. You know, I don't want him thinking about. It. I want him to be an expert on surgery, right? I don't need the owner to be an expert on construction. Okay, most owners are not. Now, there's some that are way smarter than me, know all the business development side, and they can manage the construction process, but that's not the norm. Normally, they will get someone to act on their behalf that's got their best interests in mind. So that's kind of the CM agent. Owner's rep would be the more common um, common term. And owner's rep you can have in any, so you can have a design build, design bid build, but CM agent would be specific to the construction management side of things. We'll kind of, we'll go through this just so. Um, yeah, so, so you've got the owner, so the contract is technically written between the owner and the designer, owner and the contractor, meaning this is who pays you, but this is who you deal with. You know, they're, the CM agent is probably approving change orders, approving monthly payments and all that. Uh, again, we'll skip through. So bi the big advantage, the owner kind of gets this in-house expertise, even though they're technically not in-house, uh, from the 
job site side, you may never even see the actual owner, the guy who's writing the checks. You just see the owner's rep, and for all intents and purposes, they are the owner. Uh, a big disadvantage, I'll go hit on that real quick, is that they're usually paid a percentage of the contract, so what's their incentive to keep the cost low? There's really not, you know, no immediate. Now, again, coming back to it, if you want to keep doing work, hope we're all in this to do more than one project, they're going to keep it low because they're going to keep getting work and referrals, but um, there's no immediate uh, incentive for them to keep the cost low. Okay, so see them at risk. Uh, the the at risk part comes in because the contractor, so the CM, which is I re replace most of the time with the term contractor, uh, will set a price and they assume the risks for going over that price. That's where we get the at risk part. So the the owner awards contracts separately to designer and contractor or construction manager, but encourages collaboration. I think that's where, let's see, I don't know if I got the drawing down here. Uh, probably not. Okay. Um, so early in the design process, sometimes before design starts, but always very early before design is complete, the owner will bring the contractor, the CM, construction manager, will bring them to the table. You know, so typically, now sometimes, like I said, sometimes it is before design starts so they can get, um, pre we call them pre-construction services. Uh, this they, that may be necessary for financing, but not always. Usually it's, we've got what's called design development or schematic drawings, just real basic ideas. We know it's going to be a steel structure with masonry exterior, or we know it's going to be concrete with curtain wall or, you know, it, it could go any any type of construction road. Cons we know this, we know it's going to be this type of, we know the bridge is going to span this length. We know So whatever general ideas of the project, once you kind of have the general idea, you bring the CM on board and then it becomes a collaborative design. Now the architect and engineer, they're still really doing the meat of the design. They're taking all the risks. They've they got to put their stamp on it, but and they're getting paid for the design. But the CM is providing a lot of input into that into that design. Now uh, this term, or this GMP, acronym GMP, guaranteed maximum price. So the the CM or the contractor will provide a GMP pretty close to those early stages, right? And then, so not right when they come on board but pretty soon afterwards. So they'll set a GMP. Now that GMP is set before drawings are complete, which is comes back to the owner, uh, kind of keeps control pretty far into it, but not until drawings are done. So what would be an advantage of setting a price before the drawings are complete? Why would you want to do that? The, yeah, there is certainly an element of the little kind of unknown things can be designed. So th that last 10, 15, 20% of the, of the drawing document can be designed to fit into the budget. Yeah, there is definitely an element of that. A big one is you can get to work. So once you know your price, you probably know who your major subcontractors are because they've been involved this whole time. So they've been giving you pricing information maybe kind of the design has been shifting a little bit as and you know as the design changes price is going to change as a kind of a natural occurrence uh, so there's this GMP um, now the the contract sometimes will shift over to just general contractor so we get this GMP okay now we complete our drawings okay now we're just going to say this is a lump sum and it converts back into that that's becoming less and less common. It happens sometimes, but it's uh, it's less common. So another so okay, we so we got a GMP, which is not hard to define. It's the guaranteed maximum price, which means it's the price I'm guaranteeing you I won't go over. Right? It's the maximum price, and I guarantee it. Um, now, is it really the guaranteed maximum price? What if there's a scope change? Again, it's a kind of a 
we use that word guarantee and then it, it changes a lot. But um, So why would, it, why would we not just set a price and say this is the price rather than saying this is the GMP? If it's the price, it's the maximum price, why not just say that is the price? Well, the reason is this idea of shared savings. So the owner wants to provide the contractor with some incentive to spend less, right? Because it's whatever your cost is plus a percentage, that's what you charge the owner up to this GMP. Well, I'm just going to keep spending until I, so if I can just tack on percentage, the more I spend, I'm just going to keep spending, spending, spending until I hit my GMP. You know, I don't need these additional laborers on site, but I'm going to bring them on site so I can keep spending money. That would make sense, right? Well, that's why we have this shared savings clause. So the owner will say, okay, this is your guarantee. I'll pay you whatever your cost is plus 4% or 5% or whatever, it, whatever you negotiate up to your guarantee maximum price. But if you come in under, so let's say it's 4%, whatever you spend plus 4%. But if you can't come in under that GMP, I'll give you 25% of what you save. And again, that's another one that shared savings split varies. Um, sometimes it's 50-50, sometimes it's 80-20. You 75-25 know, is very common. I had an owner once tell me uh, it's 100-0, meaning he's getting 100, I'm getting zero. But the next sentence was, oh, and by the way, I'm just going to give you this next job in the, uh, that we're doing. So I said, yes, sir. 100 zero it is um so the the incentive is so you get four percent on what you do spend you get 25 percent of what you don't spend not to mention that time and energy that went into that you would have put into spending that money so there's a lot of incentive to coming in under that price now there's some ethical issues sometimes contractors will inflate it you know they'll they'll bump that number up as much as they think they can so that they can look good by having a lot of savings and then oh by the way tack would get 25 percent of the savings um we'll talk about that ethical issues but uh, you you still want to have a good faith effort of what you think the cost is going to be but if you come up with ways of saving money so again four percent and that varies three four five percent uh five percent if you're lucky on what you do spend, 25% of what you don't spend. The owner's getting 75%, so it's good for him too. So that's kind of the way to incentivize people to come in under that uh, that price. Um, so again, before drawings are complete, the contractor, so the, the CM will typically choose most of the subs. You know, again, there's that portion that hasn't been designed yet. Maybe you just don't even bother. It's a small portion. You don't sub that out yet. Uh, but typically are brought on early, um, which leads to this subcontractor technical expert involvement in design, which is the whole, it's the crux of CM theory, getting the technical experts involved early. So you have an owner contracts with the designer, and then the owner, and I put, should have put an additional dashed line right there too, uh, contracts with the prime contractor who contracts with subcontractors, but this designer, uh, yeah, there should be one right there. Sorry about that. Uh, kind of this dashed line means there's language in the contract that says you guys need to get along and collaborate. So there's nothing, there's no legal contract binding these groups, but there's language in these contracts that says work together. So kind of talked about all these things already, but um, th the biggest advantages are you get input from the technical experts early in the process, so during design phases. The price is fixed earlier in the process, so the owner doesn't have to wait until design is complete, until they know what they're going to spend. Again, I put fixed in quotations because it can change. It's kind of a, it's a little bit of a misleading term, but we do call it. We say the price is fixed, even though it's really not. Uh, lesser likelihood for change. So why is there a lesser likelihood for changes? Why would we be less likely to have a bunch of change orders? Yeah. 
Exactly. You don't have all these constructability issues, and sometimes there are, but much, much, much less likely. Because, you, yeah, you've got the person that's going to build it. If you've got the guy that's going to, the guy that's literally going to hang the duct sitting at the design meeting, he's probably not going to get in the field and go, oh, I can't do that. Because he's going to know it way ahead of time. And when is it cheapest to change the design? During the design phase, right? It doesn't cost anything to for a few clicks on a computer. But if you've got steel in the air and you've got to send duct back to the shop to get re uh, refabricated, that's expensive, right? That's more than a couple of clicks on a computer. Uh, there are some disadvantages. Um, Sometimes you get, so we all work together, one big happy family during design phase, then you fix a price, and then we revert back to these adversarial roles. Once I, once I propose a, a GMP, I'm married to that price. I, I got to come in under it. So I have to come under it under if I don't want to lose money. I really want to come under, I want to get some shared savings. I want to get at least some shared savings. Maybe, not a, maybe I'm not going to retire on my shared savings, but I want to get something. So you can revert back to these finger pointing between architect and contractor. Uh, it's less likely just because you've been working together and you kind of have buy-in into the design, so it kind of is it's yours a little bit, but it can happen. You still kind of revert back to fighting at tables and at owners' meetings and all that. But uh, The price can grow beyond the conceived budget. So what you, so like Victoria said, you kind of design to your price, to your budget, uh, but doesn't always work uh, that neatly. It usually does, but if it, when it does grow beyond the conceived budget, um, it seems more problematic because an owner is earlier in the process has set a price once they get their financing for and they don't like to have to go back to the bank to ask for more money, uh, which you can imagine why nobody would. Um, there's a risk of poor bid coverage. What that means is, so, for general contractors bidding at a project, if they have poor coverage, that means, so uh, what's an example of a common one? Let's say toilet, access uh, toilet accessories and partitions. So, you know, the partitions between stalls and a restroom, there's a contractor that that's what they do. They install those. A really easy one to overlook because it's kind of an afterthought you do at the end of the project. Well, but what if it's a big building with lots of restrooms? It could be a big ticket item that you don't have any bids on. Or maybe you have one bid. So even if you have one bid, it's not a gap, but it's poor coverage. You want a lot, so you kind of you can zero in on what the a good price is. The reason you can have poor bid coverage is because you don't have a design completed, so you may not have toilet partitions shown in the drawings anywhere. So, of course, you're not going to get any bids on it. Uh, a large split savings, so if you come in way under that GMP, um, there's there can be a perception that you're inflating the GMP. Again, if I'm getting 4% of what I do, 25% of what I don't do, um, there can be a perception by the owner that I think that guy's trying to cheat me out of some shared savings. Um, I should get a bigger portion of that back. Now, usually if you're maintaining good communication with the owner throughout the project, he's going to you know, you would say, we found a way to save a bunch of money, and he's going to know that it's all above board, but sometimes the owner doesn't get involved, and he just sees, wait a minute, why am I, give, why am I writing a check for $250,000 to this guy at the end of the project? Um, that should be mine. So just to, to summarize, design bid build has the most history. Again, that's a little bit... Uh, of zooming in on the world in the last 100, 150 years. Technically, design build has the most history because that goes back to forever ago. But um, the most history as far as uh, a formal way of delivering projects. So, and that's, that's really why it's still used ever. Because we kind of know it's not the best way, but we know that it works. It may not work the best, but we know that it works. We know how to navigate that world of design bid build. So that's why it still is used now. It's becoming less and less common, but it's still used um, semi-frequently. Uh, and construction managers serve to advocate for owners throughout the design and construction process, meaning they get involved early. They have the owner's interest in mind early. 
they bring in experts to the table early. So that's the whole idea. That's what construction management is all about, getting the experts involved early. Uh, and construction managers, depending on how early they're brought in, uh, they might be selected solely on qualifications. So if they're brought in during early design stages, it's just qualifications. Uh, and you'll hear this, and, and I... If I had a whiteboard, I'd, I'd draw another contractual setup. But uh, you'll hear a lot about, it's another buzzword, integrated project delivery. Uh, so CM at risk and design build are integrated project delivery methods, meaning you have lots of different parties involved in doing one thing. So design bid build is not integrated because you have designers just doing their own work. You have contractors just doing their own work. And they sub it out to subs just doing their own work. Well, design, build, and CM, you bring everyone together. We all do design together. Okay, we all do some of the budgeting together, the construction together. So we're integrating these processes. That's really what integrated project delivery. So IPD is another big buzzword, and we won't go into the details of that because there's, honestly, there's not a lot of information on it. Uh, it's fairly new, but so it wouldn't be, a, you know, a owner contracts with a contractor. It's just, it's just one circle everyone so it's the owner the prime contractor the major subs there's one contract we all do it we all stand to gain or lose um, there's some great things about it there's some disadvantages to it i think it stands to be seen what what the what can be done with it currently only big big projects you know a few hundred million can kind of kind of handle that but uh um, and then again, the major advantage is getting the technical expert early. So what about the subcontractor's role? What is the subcontractor's role in all of this? In design, bid, build, in design, build, and construction management, why should a subcontractor care what the project delivery method is? Why should, why, I mean, does anybody have a guess? Why, why would they care? Yeah, that's that's a great uh, well that's a great summary. I wish I could just put that on here. So uh, you're more likely to take pride in your work. Well, we should be all taking pride in work anyway, right? But it's an incentive to take pride in your work because if you did a good job, even if you're not the low man next time, low price on the next one, if you did a good job on the last one, you're more likely to get chosen on this one because the owner, the general contractor, is interested in what is your not just your price, but what are your overall capabilities and qualifications? What what expertise can you bring to the table? If you just did the job cheap and got it done and got out of there, okay, that's nice. I may let you I may let you bid on another job. But I probably am not going to bring you to the table and just say, hey, this is your job. I want you to help with design. And you got it. I'm just going to give it to you. If I know that the last two, three, four jobs I've done with you or that uh, another someone else in my company has done with you or, or you just have a reputation for being good at not overcharging for change orders and providing good input into design, then I'm going to bring you to the table early and just give you the job. Now, there's still some level of competition. I don't mean to say that that's always just handed out, but a lot of times it is. You know, there's some... Iron workers or steel fabricators, I'll just I'll just bring to the to the table um, early. So uh, the role can range from clarifying specs to full design build. So it can be just asking for input, sending emails. Hey, can you clarify this for me? To hey, I'm going to bring you to the table and do that. Sometimes an MEP sub will literally design and stamp the MEP drawings. Um, Provide insight on means and methods. So if a GC is trying to put a schedule together to give to the owner, uh, those means and methods from the subs will be really important. 
um, input on current pricing. So these, as these projects become design, pricing is continually updated. So having a source for current pricing is, r is extremely, extremely valuable. So don't be shy about providing information on pricing. Doesn't mean you're held to a price. You're not holding. But if you say, oh yeah, concrete's going for, you know, 3,000 PSI concrete is about $85 a yard today. Or over here, I can get it for 84 or whatever. So don't be shy about sharing that kind of stuff. Uh, input on material availability. So what's going to be included in the design? Uh, if the architect said, we're going to put this tile in here, and we, uh, it's this really nice tile. Well, we it comes from Italy. Um, and you, if you're the flooring guy, you would say, uh, no, because that's going to take 12 weeks to get, and you've got a six-week schedule for flooring. So, um, or rather, it starts in six weeks. We can't do that, that type thing. So the design can change. Design assist, and this is another kind of a facet of design build. Design assist is not, not uh, so design build, you're actually taking uh, some risk or some liability for the design. Design assist, you're not. You're just giving input. So when you hear the term design assist, a lot of times that term design assist is written into contracts. That doesn't mean that you're going to stamp the drawings and take liability. That means you're going to provide input. So when you see that, that's what that means. You're going to collaborate. You're going to provide your expertise. Uh, collaborate, yeah, provide input. Do constructability reviews, kind of the idea of design assist. And that's it. Let's take a break. Uh, we're close on.